Okay, so uh, get started here. I first just wanted to go back a tiny bit uh, into some of the things that we were talking about uh, from last week. So last week we took a, a kind of a whirlwind tour through all of what is anthropology. And uh, in the last class, we're talking about some sort of huge issues, the issue of colonialism, race, racism, the idea of culture, you know, what the what our future should be like in terms of food and sustainability and diversity. Um, and so they sort of very huge ideas. And then we plunge from there straight into uh, the non-human primates and uh, dental patterns and, and very fine grained details of what, uh, what our non-human primate relatives are, are doing. Um, and it's sort of this interesting, uh, I guess, um, aspect to anthropology is that on the one hand it's these huge issues the meaning of life uh what the future of human society our past or the big picture questions but it's also these kind of it, it's always has to be based on field work and empirical evidence so you're you have to sort of do these really tiny things that might seem trivial like dental patterns of primates and then try to link that up to these larger ideas or these bigger ideas that we have so, um, you know, that's kind of where, where we are now is going into uh, a class in which we'll talk about uh, how humans fit into the primate order. This is going to be a prelude for our, how we're going to talk about uh, the history of human evolution. Uh, so this class is going to be divided in two parts. In the first part, we're going to look at uh, this primatology article by Barbara Smuts called What Are Friends For? So we're going to examine that. We're going to tack between that and the textbook chapter uh, in terms of trying to locate all of these primates that we may not be entirely familiar with uh, and how they are related to uh, each other and and to human beings. So we're going to kind of do back and forth between the uh, the Barbara Smuts article and the textbook. Uh, so we'll do that for the first part of class and then we'll take a break uh, right in the middle. And then in the second part of class, we'll go more into the textbook chapter itself and kind of the idea of primatology. So let's we'll start out with the uh, the baboons and the the article uh, that we read, uh, What Are Friends For? And uh, I finally, after many years, I got this alliteration down to beware of being bamboozled by baboons. I made it all come out as bees. What do I mean by that? I mean that sometimes when we go into an anthropology class, we take you know, the first reading and we are reading about baboons and we start to think, aha, we're reading this because they are just like us because they're so similar to us. And I'm gonna find out in my anthropology class how alike I am to baboons. And I wanna clarify that that is not why we're reading this article and that baboons are in some ways pretty distant from us. So we're gonna talk about sort of why uh, Smuts was studying baboons, what she was hoping to accomplish by studying them, in part by saying what she was not doing. So first thing I want to clarify is, is that Smuts was not studying baboons because they are somehow extremely close to us, evolutionarily speaking. They are not, uh, they are not very extremely evolutionarily close to humans. Of course, they're closer than say daffodils or horses or stuff like that, but they're not uh, close to humans in terms in comparison to other primate species. So in terms of what kinds of primates are close to humans, um, baboons are closer to humans than new world monkeys. So baboons are considered to be part of the old world monkeys and they are closer to humans than new world monkeys. So I wanna go over here and now we're going to tack over into the textbook and talk about new world monkeys for a bit. Okay, so the new world monkeys, their scientific name is Platterini, uh, which is just a, a smart way of saying the flat-nosed primates. And the reason they're called New World monkeys is because they are found in the Americas, what was considered the New World to those people who were coming from uh, Eurasia and from Africa. Uh, they, they called 
the Americas, the New World. And I've realized now I have this map behind me. So the New World monkeys would be in this part of the world, uh, especially in South America and in Central America. The New World monkeys are all arboreal or tree dwelling, and they tend to be some of our smaller monkeys. They tend to be smaller than the Old World monkeys, and of course, especially smaller than, uh, than most of the apes. Some of the New World monkeys, some of the Platyrrhini, have uh, what are called prehensile tails. They are tails that can curl around and grasp things so that the tails themselves can be useful for swinging through the trees and for grasping tree limbs. So some of the uh, New World monkeys actually have prehensile tails. They began evolving separately from the old world monkeys at about 30 to 40 million years ago, which is pretty long ago. It's a great long time, uh, even in evolutionary terms, that the new world monkeys diverged from the old world monkeys. Uh, your Michael and Gonzalez speculate on, well, how did the new world monkeys get to the new world from Africa? Uh, and one of the ideas that has been uh, floated is that they uh, basically there were these these large accumulations of branches and earth and things that would that would group up at the end of a river and then it would sort of break off and kind of float across the water. Um, it's also probable that Africa and and South America were not as far away as they are now. Um, so you know there's different ideas about how this divergence occurred. What we do know is that the old world monkeys and the new world monkeys were separated continentally and they stopped sort of interacting and interbreeding. So you have this separation between the stuff that would happen in the new world and the stuff that would happen in the old world. Here's some pictures of some of the what are called the new world monkeys, the tamarin, the spider monkey, the capuchin monkey, the cotton head tamarin. Um, you can see a little bit, I think the, you can see a little bit of some of those prehensile tails coming in, the tails that can curl around and grasp things. Uh, and these are all uh, arboreal. They're all tree dwelling. They tend to be small. They tend to be tiny and kind of screechy. Um, to me, I'm not sure if this is a nice thing to say about the New World monkeys, but they all look a little goofy to me. They look kind of funny. Um, and, you know, sometimes people will go down to South America and they'll look at these monkeys and they'll be like, I don't know, I don't see, I don't see how humans could be related to monkeys. It seems too weird, too far away. So, you know, I mean, and I can sort of see what, what people might have a point with that because, you know, this is 30 to 40 million years of evolutionary distance. The New World monkeys are pretty far away from us, evolutionarily speaking. Now, let's contrast the new world, monkey, new world monkeys with what are the old world monkeys, or scientifically the Caterini, which is uh, a scientific word for the sharp-nosed primates. So we had the flat-nosed primates in, over there in the old world in Africa and, uh, and Eurasia, we have the sharp-nosed primates. This is an infraorder, which actually includes both these old world monkeys and what are called the hominoidea, or apes and humans. So it's a, the old world monkeys are included in, the Caterini is a larger infraorder that actually includes apes and humans. Most of the old world monkeys are arboreal, that is, they're in trees, but there are others that are ground dwelling or terrestrial. None of the old world monkeys have prehensile tails. So none of those curling tails that you saw uh, in some of the new world monkeys, they tend to be larger in terms of their body size as well. Very interesting, uh, Michael and Gonzalez note that there is a shared dental formula, a shared uh, form of the teeth that uh, spans both the old world monkeys, the apes, and the humans. We all have the same uh, kind of dental structure, which is. Uh, Kind of amazing and, and very interesting. Here's a picture of some old world monkeys. So uh, we've been talking about uh, one, one group of baboons, 
uh, in the What Are Friends For article, uh, but we can also see the proboscis monkey, the mandrel, and the vervet monkey here, just you know, a selection of some of the old world monkeys. And these are mostly going to be found in Africa and also you know, in parts of Asia as well. So what is, what is known as the old world? To me, these, uh, I don't know, again, uh, they seem a little more serious. They tend to sit on the ground. They tend to sit on limbs instead of swinging from them as much. There's no prehensile tails. And you can see sometimes a little bit more the evolutionary potential relationship uh, between the old world monkeys and uh, the, the kinds of creatures that would lead to apes and to human beings. So going back to our uh, our evolutionary uh, our evolutionary chart here. Uh, we're talking about the baboons. They're old world monkeys, so they're closer to humans than the new world monkeys, but they're not as close as the apes are. So the old world monkeys diverged from the new world monkeys about 30 to 40 million years ago. But then there's another divergence within Africa between the apes and the monkeys that happens at about 20 to 30 million years ago. So uh, some people, you know, the, the quickest way to distinguish apes and monkeys, I mean, there's a number of different features, but the quickest way is that apes don't have tails. Uh, they tend to be larger than monkeys. Um, there's a number of other things that we'll talk about in terms of the, the ape species, but that's sort of the the quickest way to distinguish uh, the ape species from, from monkey species. And there was a, that divergence happens at about 20 to 30 million years ago. We'll talk about this more when we talk about the, the specifics of human evolution, but you know, in terms of the ape-human divergence, uh, the last common ancestor, the most recent common ancestor between uh, the species that would lead to chimpanzees, the species that would lead to bonobos, and humans uh, occurs at around seven to 10 million years ago. So I wanna give you a picture of this kind of in, in a tree form. Uh, Michael and Gonzalez don't really include these, uh, these sort of tree branching charts uh, in this way. So um, take a look at it from, from this perspective. So this is kind of, a, uh, a, a chart of, of a number of different uh, non-human primates. Um, if we think about, you know, the Michael and Gonzalez do discuss these prosimians over here, the lemurs and the lorises and the tarsiers. We're not going to talk about those much. They diverge from uh, some of the other uh, monkeys at about 50 or 60 million years ago. So, uh, you know, lemurs are primates, but they're, they're very distant extremely distant from humans, evolutionarily speaking. Uh, some anthropologists do study them, but, uh, but not as much. So we've been talking about, you know, the new world monkeys that diverged from the old world monkeys at about 40 million years ago. And then there's another divergence uh, between the most recent common ancestor of old world monkeys and those who would lead to apes and humans about, you know, 20, 25 million years ago. Um, these are not, you know, it's, they're, they're not, they're portrayed on this charter, this tree as kind of these clean breaks, but these are, you know, these are gradual differences that happen over a long period of time. I'll focus in on this chart here, just to give us a sense of what happens in the, in the apes. And so this is also in Muckle and Gonzalez on page 38. Um, and some of these years, uh, you know, have been pushed back a little bit for some, um, but, you know, most people think that the gibbons diverge first from some of the other apes at about 15, 16 million years ago. Then you have the, uh, the orangutans diverging off. These are all ape species. Um, the most recent common ancestors of gorillas, chimps, bonobos, and humans probably diverged off at about... Uh, mm, this is saying about 7 million years ago. More recently, I've heard more in the 10 to 12 million year ago range. And then there's this divergence that we'll, we'll talk about uh, later, which is when, you know, certain creatures became habitually bipedal, and those creatures would eventually lead into what we consider uh, the humans. Um, and then, but those, uh, there's a divergence between 
uh, the creatures that would lead to the chimps and the bonobos, which are uh, very similar looking, but uh, still separate species. And that divergence happens after the most recent common ancestor of the chimps and bonobos. So it actually is, is interesting evolutionarily speaking, chimps and bonobos and humans are actually all equidistant evolutionarily. We are all sort of uh, first cousins, you might say, uh, in terms of evolutionary relationships. And some people get really into the chimps and think that they're more like humans, but other people get really into the bonobos and think they're more like humans. Evolutionarily, we are sort of equidistant because this speciation happened after the most recent common ancestor of all three species. Any questions about kind of the, uh, the monkeys, apes, relationship here? Anything on your mind about evolution primates? All right. So heading back into this slide that we've been talking about, about why Barbara Smuts might have been studying baboons. They are not evolutionarily close to humans. They're closer than some other species, but they're not super close. Um, you know, and we talked about all of these kinds of, uh, the relationship of different primate species. And so I'd emphasize here is, is, is to be careful. She's not studying them because they are supposed to be just like us. And I would also say that, you know, uh, be careful because uh, things like all of many primate species we'll talk about later are very social and they exhibit things like friendship. So the baboons, as we'll see, are one uh, species that exhibit things that we can talk about in terms of friendship measures. But, you know, those are also seen in, in bonobos and chimps and other kinds of, uh, all of the primates uh, tend to be a very social species. So this is all adding up to, well, I'm going to see if this works where I'm going to try and, and do the, uh, the first quiz question as a poll. I think we've talked through and eliminated most of the wrong answers. I don't think, I'm not going to yet quite give away the right answer, but I'll try and, uh, I'll try and run the poll and we'll, uh, we'll see how this works. We'll experiment. Okay, I've got 26 of 27 votes. So if you haven't put your vote in, try to get that in. If for some reason you'll miss it, you can always send it to me as an email or in the chat. Let's see, we're almost there. We're almost at two minutes. So we'll end the poll. And uh, I think we did a little bit better than the quiz. We now have a at least a majority, you know, 
most of you, I won't say most of you, a decent amount pick the right answer, the one that's, that's the least wrong, which is that remember that, you know, baboons are not that close to us in evolutionary terms. They're not that similar to us. Other primates exhibit friendship behaviors. So what, uh, what, Barbara's, or what Barbara Smuts is testing here is uh, the, what, she's, what, what she calls uh, the dominance hypothesis. So that's what she um, sets out to study here in her, in, in, in trying to think about uh, what the baboons are doing and what their behavior is like. Now, the dominance hypothesis is, uh, I guess I would say, it, it, to say the word hypothesis about it is a little bit, um, and gives, it gives it a little bit too much credence. It's kind of a popular stereotype for how it is. Hmm. Ah, wait a second. Somebody says they can't see anything. Let me see if I can get the screen to share again. Okay, thanks. <laughs> so, uh, perhaps when I launch the poll, I have to take the poll off. Um, so, uh, why does Smuts study baboons? Uh, she is thinking about or examining this idea of the dominance hypothesis. This is basically a kind of stereotype for how gender relationships work in the families of today. Um, so, the dominance hypothesis is uh, you know, you kind of might know this from sort of, uh, like I said, stereotypes or popular TV shows or the Flintstones, which is that, you know, that, that males are competing with each other over for the attention of females. So the females would be, in this sense, be simply the passive objects of male competition. The females, you know, once sort of the dominant male has won out, the role of the female then would be to have offspring for the winner of this male competition. The males in this scenario become the providers. And as the providers, they would uh, retain their sort of aggressiveness and their protectiveness over the females. And they would be, you know, going out and working or hunting or whatever it is they do to to bring home the food or bring home the the bacon back to the to the house or back to the, the, the wherever the the females are and as such the males would then as the winners of this competition but also as the providers would need to demand sexual exclusivity they wouldn't want anything going on they wouldn't want any uh, any other monkeys coming in while they were out doing their providing. And then the, what, the reason you'd want to ensure or demand sexual exclusivity is that the males wanted to make sure that the, the, the youngsters were actually related to them, that they'd be their genetic offspring. And so this is the idea of how, uh, you know, the idea is that the reason we have the families that we have today, the origin of the nuclear family is because of male competition over females leading uh, to dominant males. And then, you know, that this would, uh, this would lead to the idea of wanting sexual exclusivity and to the idea of today's uh, sort of uh, family structure. So Smuts is going in and she's looking in this article and this comes up in a couple pages on page 38. And then again, at the very end, she goes back to this sort of examining the, whether the, the dominance hypothesis holds uh, sway. Now, baboons are an extremely good test case for the dominance hypothesis. So they are, like I said, they're not, ex they're not very related to humans, evolutionarily speaking, but if we wanted to see, find a species that was a great test of dominance hypothesis, baboons are wonderful. 
And the reasons they're wonderful are because they are a promiscuous species. They do not mate for life. They are not uh, monogamous forever. They have multiple, uh, typically multiple mates over their mating periods. Um, but those mates, mating, mating uh, partners are not random. So it will be sort of, you know, one, one during a, a certain time. Um, and there are patterns to them. There are, there are ways in which we can analyze them because it's not just sort of every, every anything goes here. It is, it is promiscuous in that they are not long-term relationships, but they are, uh, they are specific and they are patterned uh, within the group. Baboons also are a good test case because unlike, uh, especially bonobos, uh, they have very specific uh, mating times. So they will only have, uh, have sex during estrus or what was once called uh, sort of being in heat, I think we say for dogs. Uh, so only at the times that the female is fertile will there be mating going on. So it makes it easier as a primatologist, if you're looking at these species, to analyze, uh, you know, what the, uh, what the paternal, uh, which offspring are going to be related to whom. Uh, the baboons are also a good test because uh, they are extremely aggressive. They're very strong and as much as their teeth are sharper than lions, uh, canines. So uh, they're, they, they're, they, the males especially can be very strong and, and very violent. Uh, the males are also larger, on average about twice as large as the female. So we have these aggressive and also uh, larger males uh, quite quite dominant here. And uh, it's not, uh, not a great picture uh, if you're uh, a female baboon. Uh, Smuts mentions that on average, there would be a, a slash wound on a female about once per year. So again, I, I emphasize this is not, the, the, the baboons are not just like us. I know that humans are not exactly perfect when it comes to these kinds of things, but this is quite a different picture than we have among human beings, thankfully. Um, but it does make them a very good test of the dominance hypothesis. Now, before we go on in that, I want to just concentrate on uh, this, uh, this notion of the males uh, being twice as large as females. This is called sexual dimorphism. And I want to just um, talk a little bit about sexual dimorphism in primates because it, it illustrates something about primates in general that we'll talk about later. So, Sexual dimorphism refers to when you have males and females, uh, there might be differences in characteristics uh, between them biologically. This is one potential difference that we can measure is there are, some, are size differences. So um, there are some species like most insects and most fish in which females are, are on average larger than males. Among primates, uh, there is significant variability here. So among the apes, the gibbons, that we talked about, they are actually about the same size in terms of the males and the females. Uh, there, there's not a sexual dimorphism uh, by size on average among the gibbons. There are several species of primates in which the males are a little bit larger than the females, from about eight to 15% larger on average. So humans actually fall into that category where on average males are eight to 15% across our, our species uh, larger than, than females. Uh, but also interestingly, this is about uh, the same kind of thing that you see among the chimpanzees and among the bonobos where the males are a little bit larger than females on average, uh, but not that much. Gorillas, tend to be uh, on the, where the males are about 50% larger than females. However, there is some variation by group among the gorillas. The mountain gorillas and the lowland gorillas have a difference in terms of uh, their relative sexual dimorphism. So this actually varies not only within the species, but within the group of, of gorillas that you have. And then we've just been talking about the baboons in which we see a pretty a strong or extreme form of sexual dimorphism where the males are about twice the size of the females. I want you to note here, I want to sort of really point out is how much variation we see. So we see variation across species, but we also see variation uh, in different groups. 
And we also see individual variation. So, you know, I mean, although these are averages, we all know that there are uh, females that are larger than males and males that are smaller than females. So we're talking here about an average across a, across a group, um, and there's always going to be variation uh, within that average. The other thing that's interesting here is that uh, when it comes to humans, there's also social and historical variations. So different societies and over time can have a different uh, sexual dimorphism. So in the United States, this figure of, you know, the males used to be about 10 to 15 percent larger than females uh, when they were adults, and now it's more like about 8 to 9 percent larger. We might speculate as to why that is. Of course, you know, 100 years ago, um, the idea was that the men had to go out and do uh, the, the more important or the the manual labor or the, the wage earning labor. And so it might be that the, the parents tended to prioritize the nutritional needs and the protein that the, the men would get. And the, the women might, uh, might not have their nutritional needs met as much. Now, hopefully we are in a different state and we tend to be a little bit uh, more attentive to both. And we can kind of see that a little bit in the in terms of how the sexual dimorphism has changed over time, even in our own society. All right, so we're going back now into the, uh, the SMUS article to find out, you know, what are the findings or what does she find in terms of the dominance hypothesis? One of the most interesting things is that from the very beginning of this article, she finds that it is not simply the males that are uh, doing the competing and the females have no choice about their mates. The females are able to, you know, rebuff the advances of certain males and scamper off or protect each other. And so you have uh, the clear expression of female choice and preference when it comes to mating. And of course, this article is about, you know, what are friends for? Uh, Smuts defines friendship. Uh, she obviously cannot talk to the uh, baboons. She can't, this is not a psychological parallel. Uh, this, is, this is a measure of how close they are to each other, how much time they spend in proximity to each other, and how much grooming do they do of each other. So these are simply, uh, when she talks about friendship, she is talking about uh, something that is uh, defined empirically or that you can measure because we don't have a sort of a way of, of, of communicating that. We're, uh, we're not saying that they, they have a notion of friendship. We're simply talking about uh, where we see them, uh, where, where we see them in these kinds of, of pairs and groups. Super interesting and uh, one of you on the discussion board found, did a great job uh, talking about this is that it isn't the most dominant males that have the most friends, it's actually the older males that end up over time having more friends uh, than the, the necessarily the more dominant males. This must discusses that the, the females get a number of benefits from this friendship. They get protection for themselves and for their young. They get access to resources such as feeding spots, so they get some, some benefits from this. Uh, also sort of fascinating is that some of the uh, male friends will care for infants, will actually sort of uh, take uh, infants under their own uh, protection. And here's kind of the, 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 the super fascinating thing about this article is that in fact a male friend might care for an infant which is not necessarily genetically related to the male baboon. And that uh, Smuts discovered that uh, the infant care was more likely if it were a male friend, that, that male friendship would be a larger predictor of uh, infant care than paternity. So um, perhaps not what we might have expected, especially from the dominance hypothesis, that you'd have infant care coming from friends uh, more likely than from parents. Now we might wonder, well, what, what do the male friends get out of this arrangement? Uh, Smuts mentions that this may increase their mating chances with, with a female later on. So it might not be uh, an immediate payoff 
um, but there are there may be um, an increased chance of mating uh, later on. So there are there are some reproductive uh, advantages that the males may have from uh, from developing these friendships. So back to the main idea: do does the does the hypothesis of male dominance or the male dominance hypothesis find support in this uh, in this study? And basically, the answer is for several reasons: no. Smuts says on page forty four that. What she discovers is that it is possible to have long-term social bonds uh, between primates as friends. And you can do that without having a sexual division of labor. That is all the baboons are kind of doing the same thing or food sharing. So this has been some of the classic reasons why people talk about uh, why uh, humans and other primates form bonds is because you know men and women are doing different things and they then come together to share food. But in fact, among the baboons, we see these long-term social bonds that happen without this uh, sort of uh, men going off and women at home or those uh, sort of classic stereotypes about the, the social divisions of labor. She also discovers, as we've just been talking about, that you can have friendship between males and females without necessarily demanding uh, sexual exclusivity, that doesn't have to be uh, necessarily uh, part of the, the deal that you can have uh, uh, male-female relationships as friends without necessarily that uh, being uh, either uh, being for, for all time as sexually exclusive. And perhaps most importantly, that males can play parental roles uh, without necessarily having biological or genetic paternity. So in fact, we come back to the, uh, the expected, uh, the hypothesis of male dominance. Baboons definitely do not confirm the male dominance outcomes, which we thought. So that's, uh, that's been the first part of class, which is, you know, going between the uh, what are friends for article in the textbook to try and figure out our relationship among primates. I'm going to now uh, try to launch poll number two, which is, you know, basically sums up 